Matthew 7, 6. This is a verse that's been on my mind a little bit. I want to study it more. I think it's relevant to all of us. Look at Matthew 7, verse 6. It says, um, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Cast not your pearls before the swine. We say it sometimes, right? But what does it really mean? What does it mean? And how can we live out that call in the midst of a command and guidance from Christ to go preach the gospel to every creature, right? We're supposed to go preach the gospel to every creature. We're supposed to be faithful witnesses, we're supposed to get ready to give an answer to every man. Yet Christ, here in this passage, tells us there is some limitation to who we cast holy things toward. And the context here is that. Remember, this is the context that talks about how to um, judge appropriately, right? You remove the beam from your eye. You can help the other person with the beam in their eye. And then it says, Christ says, but don't cast your pearls before swine. So at our church, I know we are very soul-minded. We're very witness-minded, and I love that. I want us to continue to be that. But we also have got to understand what Christ is saying here, and I need to understand it better. What is a pearl? What is a swine? When does this verse apply? When do we hold back some of the precious promises that we know? When do we hold those back? And of course, this is, it's good to think about because we believe in the power of the Bible, right? The, bow, the Bible is what can break down a stony heart. Yet, Christ still says there are some times when we don't share that precious truth that we have. want to be able to put this in the right um Right measure, you know, how do you practice and live this out? We're looking at Matthew chapter 7 and verse 6. So the limit is, he mentions two limits here, pearls. Cast not your pearls before swine. So the pearl is obviously something, it's too great of a gift to share. And the swine speaks to the audience. The audience is too wicked of an audience to receive it. And then he says there's a result that happens when we do this. When we share something precious with an audience that's not suited for it, um, he says, the swine, it says, will trample them under their feet. The swine, that audience, will take that precious thing we shared and just stomp all over them and then turn again and rend you. So, so they'll run at you. They'll attack you. And Christ gives us wisdom that sometimes we need to be ready for this and even avoid this. Again, you've got to compare this to other scripture that says we're ready to be persecuted, right? We're ready to be mocked. Yet this wisdom is still in the Bible that sometimes we should hold back these precious things we have from the wrong audience. Think about this term swine. I grew up with some pigs. We'd usually raise a couple of pigs, one or two pigs at a time for meat. And pigs, some, we had some pigs that were mean. You would go, I would go in there to feed the pigs, and they would chase you out of the pen. I remember like jumping over the side of the of the fence to get out of the pen. Pigs can be mean. They even they even I've heard that they bite. They never bit me, but I think they bit someone I knew. Once in a while, I get a mad one, frustrated one. Probably they were mistreated by somebody, but who knows? Anyways, pigs dangerous. That's Christ uses them in the analogy here. But let's first talk about what's a pearl. And I'm going to move swiftly because we don't have a lot of time. But what's a pearl? A pearl is something precious, right? Something valuable. Something pure. Think of a pearl. You think of something very pure, holy. So, obviously, so I just, there are probably more than this list, but some very obviously holy things in my mind. It's Christ our Savior, is it not? It says in 1 Peter 1.19, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, I think Christ, the Savior Jesus Christ, is a pearl. Sometimes you're going to walk into a conversation where a person is not ready at all to receive Jesus Christ. That sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but I, th- I think it's true. God wants to save them. You need to share the gospel with them. But at that moment, they're just going to stomp on it and make fun of it and probably come back and attack you. Another thing is pure, I believe, is this. You say, Logan, this is pretty broad, but I believe it's true. Twelve, uh, so, uh, Psalms 12, 6, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Our Bible is pure. Our Bible is precious and valuable. 
say, Logan, you're saying don't share the Bible with people. I'm saying in some situations, people are not ready to hear the precious promises of Scripture. So we throw them out. They say, hey, you guys hear about these wonderful promises of a Savior, of, of heaven, of this abundant life we can live on earth, and they trample it. What else is pure? I thought of the church. In 1 Corinthians three sixteen and 7, it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. God's gathering the saints together. God's church is holy. Sometimes we're, we really want to... You know, we want other people, come on out, you know, be a part of the church and be a part of the fellowship with God's people. But if there are swine in that moment, it's a bad thing to offer. They'll, they'll stomp on it, they'll trample it, and they'll turn again and rend you. Some people aren't ready to receive the blood of Christ. They're not ready to receive the promise of the scriptures. They're not ready to receive the fellowship of the saints. There are probably more precious things you can think about, but I think those are kind of a top three there. That's a pearl. Well, what's a swine? I want to spend some more time here. We'll turn some places. Please turn your Bibles to 2 Peter 2. I want to be careful with this study because I don't want us to walk out and think, I'm not going to share with anybody because everybody's a swine. I don't think we can say that. But I do think in some instances we we should consider it. I've already heard some great stories of people witnessing over the holiday. Well done. I had some good opportunity to too, and I don't think I, I don't think I was talking to a swine. I think I was talking to some people who wanted to hear. And we'll talk about that audience as well. The swine audience, what that looks like, and then the other audience, what that looks like. So what's a swine? Look at Second Peter two ten. I think this will help us understand it. And why, what got me here was 2.12. Look at Second Peter 2.12. It says, but these as natural brute beasts. So it describes this. I think it really adds to what Christ said about the swine. Let's start, though, in verse 10. Second Peter 2.10. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. Okay, so kind of got an indicator that person's just walking in sin. But that's a lot of people, okay? But they're walking in sin and despise government. They cannot stand authority whatsoever. Presumptuous are they. They just presume that they already know everything. Presume they have all the answers. Self-willed. They are very egocentric. I mean, they are the authority. Their will is what matters, not God's will or what you're trying to tell them. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. So they're not afraid to talk bad about things that are important like God or the Bible or right, people in your church. Or, it says verse 11, whereas, angel, whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. The angels are even careful in how they speak of authority. Interesting, is they have a sense of propriety a little bit. Uh, yeah, they do. Look at verse 12. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Not a happy outcome for the swine in this state. They need a change of heart. But they're not ready to receive anything good at this time. 13. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the day of time. In the the daytime, spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. There's this concept of spots in your feast of charity, in your times of fellowship around God and His Word. Sometimes you get swine among you who are not there for the right reasons. They're there and they're turning and they're rending things and they're speaking evil of things, right? This isn't a lesson that says we're going to bar the doors of fellowships and you can't go talk to people. I'm just saying we need to be mindful of this side of Scripture. Look at 14. Having eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin. And this obviously this swine crowd is a crowd that's in sin and they, they don't have no thought about leaving it right then. They are all about it. In that moment at least, in that season, they are all about their sin. You can't tell them one thing or another. 
beguiling, unstable souls. Although they might not admit it, they are unstable. And that's why you care about them. You can see it. In heart, they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Yes, the sad thing is when swine are raising kids, it's a sad upbringing for children. I believe this passage speaks some about it describes the swine force. It describes then, it talks about like leaders who are swines and how they're leading people astray, how they're really clouds without water. There's nothing really there. But look down, would you, at verse um, 22. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Some swine we run into are swine that step out of the pen. They have this spiritual moment, but their heart is still in the pen, and eventually they end up back there. Like this pig that eventually ends up back wallowing in the mire. So I'm trying to define swine for us. Some of these words, I think, help. Especially those words we started with. Some of those, the self-willed, presumptuous, can it cease from sin? If you're trying to talk to somebody and want to reach them, but this is really where they are right now, it might be an indication that we love them, we pray for them, but they might not be ready to receive the precious truths that you have in your hand. It might take, we'll talk about it later, it might take God talking to them over time for them to be ready, ready to receive the precious promises of Scripture. Look at Jude. The book of Jude sounds just like Second Peter 2, at least a lot of it does. Book of Jude, so turn right to your right. I want to, you want to get this right too, right? I want to get this right. We, we want to reach everybody, but how do we correctly apply this passage? Jude, let's look at Jude verse 3 and 4. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you. And exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. I like Jude because Jude is going to talk about brute beasts as well. But it starts with this idea of you know, there's going to be sometimes you have to contend for the faith. So contending for the faith, I believe, and sharing the faith are related, but they're a little bit different, aren't they? Sharing the faith is when you're trying to, hey, you know, this is what Christ did for you because you're a sinner and because you need, right, you, you need trust to shed blood to wash your sins away. That's sharing the faith, and that's what we all love to do. Contending for the faith, though, is a little bit different. It kind of how you, I'd picture, well, let me say this. We load the pigs up to get on the truck to go get butchered. Poor pigs, right? Here we are, we're going to eat them. I'm picking on them now. But to load them up, sometimes it, take, it takes some prodding. It takes some pushing to get them on the truck. Some contending. It would literally would be like a fight to get it on the truck sometimes. Well, sometimes in, in faith work, it's not a sharing, it's a contending. We're saying, no, that's a lie. This is what's true. And I don't care whether you believe it right now or not. I'm going to contend for what's right. Okay? Because other people are listening. And you might not be ready to receive it, but this is what's right and I'm going to say it. So don't, I think we're always supposed to do that when the need arises. Contend for the faith. We don't compromise. We don't fold up. And when it comes to swine, I think sometimes this is what we have to do. Look at four. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a swine. Someone destroying Christ, his name, and what he did. That person needs contended against. It's kind of like I've had different moments where I've argued with other faith leaders. And to be honest, a lot of times, like when I've argued with pastors in local churches and different people of leaders and denominations, and rarely do I get the sense from God that I'm trying to win them, win their souls. Usually from God, I get this sense of I need to rebuke them and rebuke them sharply because they're leading thousands, hundreds, right? A hundred people astray. That's the side of Christianity we need to be mindful of, this contending for the faith. And I think a lot of it has to do with when you meet a swine who's living in the mire or who's telling other people to wallow in the mire as well. 
Look at Jude 8. It goes right. It talks about Sodom and Gomorrah here. Talk about some um, wallowing in the mire. But look at 8. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. There's that same kind of language. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Again, it, it equates that trait of speaking evil against authority. It says that even Michael the archangel, right, wouldn't bring against this accusation when he was contending with the devil. But he said, The Lord rebuke thee. Even there, there was a sense of honoring, to some level, authority. The swine do not do that in this life. They give no care for authority, whether it be government or whether it be church-related. It can be in homes, um, age-related. It doesn't matter to them. Look at 10. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally is brute beasts, and those things they corrupt themselves. Again, the traits uh, of a brute beast, just an uh, animal. It says in verse 11, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Name some different people there who really messed up, including Cain. Remember Cain? Cain went from somebody who could have done right, to he had a second chance to do right, and God saying, why don't you just do right? But then after that, what did he go to? A brute beast who's out ready to kill his brother. And he did. Cain went from the mode of being reachable to all of a sudden he needed to be uh, rebuked, rebukable. Look at 12. These are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. This is that spots in your feast of charity concept, with this, which is worth studying in your own time. Because we all like to open our homes and have friends over and you know bring all the family out for Thanksgiving. And we, will, we will witness to the family, right? And I even encourage you to do that all the time. I do. But sometimes you bring in a swine or a spot, at least in that moment, and what they do is they just ruin that whole experiment. You're trying to witness to people who would listen, and they're talking, right, blasphemous things, things just attacking any authority of the Bible or the church, or they hurt the situation. Those are spots in your feast of charity, and our hearts go out and we're like, oh man, well, I want everybody there. I mean, God's not willing that any should perish. I want everybody there at my table so I can reach them all. Well, I think that shows a loving heart, but I, th what I want my life, I want a good mixture of love and wisdom. Don't you? To see the difference of someone here who is reachable, they want to find the truth, and somebody who's, who's just actively fighting against it. It says, 13, raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame. That's a good kind of indicator. If you see someone just talking about shameful things, bragging about shameful things, proud of their shameful things, they might not be in the best spot to receive precious things. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. I think some helpful language there. Look over at Jude verse 22. It says, And of some have compassion, making a difference. I don't want you to end this Bible study saying Pastor Logan's not loving, doesn't have compassion. There it is. We are called to have compassion and we will reach many a person with a soft introduction of the gospel story, right? Here's, here's the truth, my friend, that you're looking for, that Jesus Christ died for the ungodly, right? He's buried and he rose again and his shed blood can wash your sins away. You just need to believe on it. There are, there are times for that, and I hope you're ready to pounce on that and share that compassion. But if we're biblicists, don't neglect to read and understand verse 23. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. So say you're talking to somebody, and they are 
foaming out their own shame at the dinner table or wherever, some gathering. They're foaming out their own shame. They might not be ready for it. Well, my friend, we're all sinners. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. And they might not be ready for it. They might need this... This save with fear, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You might need to just boldly say, that's just wrong. That's shameful. That's an ungodly thing to say. That's an ungodly way to live. You might just need to say that and leave it there. Then you might just need to say something. Hey, you know what? If if you're going to foam out shame, then I don't want you at the next gathering. It's not right. It ruins the godly atmosphere that I want in my home. You, you, have, you, have, you have fair reason to do that. And again, we've got to fight against our emotion because we're like, well, I love this person. I love this. I want them to get right. I want them to get right. But if they're hurting other people, is it worth it? I think God's principle here of cast not your pearls before swine and don't have spots in your feast of charity should be on our minds. Does it make sense at all? Yes, there are people who I believe would overuse this principle I've met some who will start calling everybody's a swine no one's worth talking to right they overdo it they jump in the other ditch but the opposite ditch is saying everybody is just ready for Jesus might not be they might not be ready for that pearl I'm making any sense this morning or not really make sense yep I guess it's kind of a game of picking your battles spiritually praying them through praying them through what is trampling and what is rending? Let's look at this a little bit. It talks about this swine. You share these pearls and they come back and they start trampling them and rending them. Let's look at Proverbs 26. I thought Proverbs 26 was a good way to understand this. Proverbs 26. You know, a lot of Proverbs, the chapters, they'll jump from an idea to a different idea to a different concept to a different concept. This section kind of gives us a continuation of a thought here on the same principle. Watch. Proverbs 26, verse 1. I think it's re- very related to the pearls before swine. 26, 1. As snow in summer and as rain in harvest, so honor is not seemly for a fool. Think about that. There are some people who we should not give honor to, at least in that moment. Well, I'm going to honor you. You're going to sit at my table and here, have another piece of pumpkin pie because you deserve it. Actually, sometimes you've got a fool who's foaming out shame. Maybe they don't deserve a piece of pumpkin pie. Maybe they shouldn't be sitting at the table now or next year. I don't know. The biblical concept, there's a time when we don't need to bestow honor on somebody, a fool. Two, as the bird is wander, as the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. Three, a whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass, and a rod for the fool's back. I don't expect you to pull out a whip and start hitting people, but in my thinking, that applies to a rebuke. Sometimes the foolish speaking needs to be rebuked. Four, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like him. So we let the fool just keep running his mouth and talking about these foolish things. People are going to end up like that person. Five, answer fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. It says the same thing, but it says it differently, right? Answer not a fool according to his folly. And then verse five says, answer fool according to his folly. What you do is you go right to the heart of his foolishness and you say, that's wrong. You pinpoint it. You don't keep the conversation going down that pitiful direction. You jump on that and say, that's nonsense. That's blasphemy. That's shameful. What's wrong? I'm pointing it out. Six, he that sendeth a message by the hand of a fool cutteth off, cutteth off the feet and drinketh damage. This, I think, gets to that idea of giving a pearl to somebody who's not ready for it, who won't care for it. It's like sending a message, right? Sending a message by the hand of a fool, cut off the feet. You want a message to go out, but you cut your own feet off. Not a good idea. You want a message to go out well, like the gospel? Give it to a brute beast. 
7. They don't give it a root be 7. The legs of the lame are not equal. So is a parable in the mouth of fools. You could share some of these wonderful, precious parables from Jesus Christ with brute beasts. And you give it to them and they just chew it all up and spit it out. Eight. As he that bindeth a stone and a sling, so is he that giveth honor to a fool. Think about that. You bind a stone and a sling. It's just getting ready to hit somebody. He that giveth honor to a fool. You wouldn't give a foolish person a bunch of weapons, would you? Here, why don't you take this bow and arrow and try it out? No, you'd, you'd be cautious with what you give them. 9. As a thorn goeth up into the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. That's good, isn't it? Ever talk to, I mentioned recently that I talked to a drunk recently. I was reminded of how terrible that is. But ever tried to witness to a drunk person? That right there, at least in that moment, that is absolutely a swine. They're not even full capacity. No use. One time we had people come in the door, and when they come to church, like, I'm all, oh, we need, to, we need to work with them, witness to them, witness to them. And I was sitting with this lady, and my wife and I were sitting with this lady for a while, and we quickly realized that she was out of it, drunk. And so then my mind flips from, there ain't no use sharing anything precious right now. And I hope you come back to church when you're sober, but you're, you're out of it right now. That's kind of, a, in a nutshell, that whole principle, I think. The swine, they're just not ready. They're not of a right mind to receive something as precious as what we wanted to share. Look at 10. The great God that formed all things, both rewarded the fool and rewarded the transgressors. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Some of this language is very similar, isn't it, to what we see in the New Testament. Nothing changes. People don't change. Seest thou a wise man in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. That speaks to that presumptuous thing, right? The self-will, that's pinpointing them. You're trying to talk to these people, but he is so wise in his own opinion. There's no hope in that moment. Something's got to bring that person down a little bit. You can try with a rebuke, right? But it might be life has got to just humble him a little bit. 13. The slothful man saith, There is a lion in the way. A lion is in the streets. As the door turneth upon the hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. The slothful hideth his hand in his bosom and grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. This man is just plain lazy. But watch. 16. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. This lazy guy on his bed making excuses. You can send your seven wisest men in there to try to witness to this guy. And he would still render an excuse. That's a brute beast, isn't it? They say, we want to reach people. Oh, let's, send, let's send our best team of witnesses down to this house. right? And they're going to pray through it. And they're going to share these precious verses. They know a lot of verses. And the guy just makes excuses. It's a brute beast. They're not ready to receive something precious. He that passeth by and meddleth with strife, belonging not to him, is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. I've noticed this, that brute beasts love drama. And what often, when you invite them into your table, what they'll often do is find the drama and exploit it. That's what they'll be interested in. They are drama kings and queens, and they will meddle with whatever strife. Oh, you're not getting along with your, with your father because you're witnessing to him. Well, maybe you're witnessing too hard. Maybe you need to try different languages. All of a sudden, they're an expert, right, on, on the, why there's a divide in your family when it's a spiritual thing that they know nothing about. 18. As a madman who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man that deceiveth his neighbor and saith, Am not I in sport? Brute beasts are also very often very cavalier. They'll say these outlandish things, and then they can always come back and say, I'm just joking, just kidding. 20. Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out, so where there is no tail bear, the strife ceaseth. That's key, isn't it? You get the brute beast out of your lives, away from your tables, the strife goes down. As coals are to burning coals, and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. He's just there uh, making things worse. The words of a tail bear are as wounds, and they go down in the innermost parts of the belly. And that's a real danger with hanging around people when you, with, you don't know what's going to come out of their mouth and you really don't know what damage it could cause. But it, it creates a wound somewhere. Somebody hears this from afar, or even you hear it, and it sticks with you, these lies that a brute beast might tell. It hurts you. Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a potsherd covered with silver dross. 
He that hateth dissembleth with his lips, and layeth up deceit within him. When he speaketh fair, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. I think one of the scariest things is when you've met a brute beast and you know this person's not in a good spot, but you see them putting on a show around your friends and family, and like you know this guy's a mess, but now he's talking all spiritual to your friends and family, and inside there's seven abominations in his heart. That's when you're like you're realizing, oh, I just brought in the con man. And everybody thinks he's just a, a spiritual guru, but this guy's the con man. I know his real heart. You ever had this? I've, I think I've seen this play out in real time, where I'm like, I shouldn't have had this person here anyways, because I know he's a mess. But now everybody thinks he's a spiritual guru. Now I've got to do all this damage control to say, no, actually, this guy, don't, don't listen to him. He's way off. 26. Whose hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation. Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth the stone it will return upon him. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. Even the wickedness that a brute beast does, it does come back to haunt them as well. It hurts them. No good. Proverbs, um, I think this is also related to Proverbs chapter 9, verse 7. Proverbs 9, 7. But anyways, we, I remember that Proverbs 26. I think it's a good, uh, it's a really full list of what a brute beast looks like and how we should handle it. Proverbs 9, 7, and 8 says, He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame. He that rebu- rebuketh a wicked man giveth himself a blot. This is even when you're trying to contend, you're still going to have him charge back at you. Reprove not a scorner lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. I think that's another indication. Let's say that you've, you've met a brute beast. You weren't sure if he was or not, but you shared some things and they were just completely rejected. Well, then you've got some good indication that you've met yourself a scorner, you've met yourself a brute beast. Someone wasn't ready to hear the truth anyways. What are we looking for then? we got like one minute left. What are we looking for? Just let me give you a quick list. If, I'll tell you what, as Christians, we are longing to find the hearts that are seeking God. And I don't mean that to be a pun, but over in Psalm 42, remember... Psalm 42, verse 1 says, As the heart, that's, that's an old word for deer, as the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Good morning. That's Psalm 42. There are some people who are panting after God. They're seeking God. And boy, we, we want to meet them. We want to tell them that we, we, can, we know what they're looking for. We know where the water is. Boy, instead of a swine, let us let us find and have hearts, deer in our lives that are looking for God. That whole passage describes that kind of heart. Also, and I'm not trying to be overly cute here, but remember Matthew 15? I'm breezing through these because we don't have a lot of time. But Matthew 15 and verse 26, Christ... Ends up talking to this woman that that he was not intending to talk to. Matthew fifteen twenty six. More in fact, look back at Matthew fifteen twenty three. But he, Matthew fifteen twenty three. But he, Jesus, answered her not a word. This woman keeps talking to him. She needs help, but he's not answering her. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, "Send her away, for she crieth after us." But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew fifteen twenty five. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. This woman was a Gentile. She wasn't a Jew. And also, I think she had some big problems in her life. Jesus here feels free to call her a dog, yet her in this moment, she's so humble and she wants God so badly 
That watch what happens. 28. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee as thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. She got her prayer request. She was at a low, low point in life where her daughter needed help and she was seeking God like crazy. I think this woman, you could, you could say, was probably an example of someone that was a swine at one point and now she's seeking God. So is there hope for the swines in the world? Absolutely. I believe there is. It might take some circumstances like this, and we'll see their hearts when they come back and they're pleading. And they say, no, no, Lord, please, Lord, please. That's a change of heart, isn't it? And that's what we want to see in people's lives. And then we see that God is long-suffering. God's merciful. God will give opportunity to people. Jesus here mentions the lost sheep. That's another category. So you have the, the deer that's seeking, a dog here with great faith, and then the sheep, a sheep that knows it's lost. Some people in life, all we're looking for them, all God is looking for for them is for them to admit that they're lost and they need found. And you can read about that throughout all the Gospels. But Luke 15.4 says, What man of you have in a hundred sheep, if you lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? Remember that same kind of thought? He says, the whole need not a physician. All right? Those who don't think they're lost, they don't need found. God is ready to save anybody who's looking for him, who knows that they're lost. Those are good conversation to have. What I'm saying here at the end is there are still plenty of people to talk to. And even the swine, at some point we're praying they'll come back and be ready for something precious. In Luke 15, uh, we are out of time. Luke 15, another uh, thought if you want to study this further. Read Luke chapter 15. Um, it, of course, goes to that story of the prodigal son. Which is a good story here, because the prodigal son literally, <laughs> and uh, not just figuratively, literally goes to the swine pen. So I think you say he qualifies as a swine. But what does the prodigal son do? He eventually says, why am I living here? Right? I could be in my father's house. And then in that humility, you know the story, he goes back and says, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. That, I think, is, it gives wonderful hope if you know a prodigal son, a prodigal type person. If you know them, there is wonderful hope that that could be their story. They complete, completely chose the swine path, but then they realized that the pig pen was the pig pen. And they could be feasting with the father. So there's hope. Don't let this lesson, I pray that this lesson that we pre, that we teach and preach this morning isn't a negative one to you. It's more of a a lesson of caution for all of us. And then we still should have hope. Still keep them in your prayers. Just maybe not, maybe we don't give them that third piece of pie and tell them to give a speech. <laughs> Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us to apply, Lord, this, this rule. Lord, it, it seems kind of difficult um, because we love people. We know you love people. We know that you want to reach people. But Lord, it's, it's truth. Christ said it. So help us know how to apply this rule about not casting our pearls before the swine. Uh, give us wisdom in this area. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.